Okay, it's time to begin our morning service. If you're visiting with us, thank you. You're an honored guest, and we hope you come back to see us again. Also, take the time to fill out a visitor's card and place it in the tray or leave it on the pew. And if you have a phone or any other electronic device, could you silence that at this time so it does not become a distraction to others during service? <clears throat> Teresa Tatum is confined at home. Mary Spate needs her prayers, and she is suffering from, with severe back pain. Melissa Shirley is... Melissa Shirley is recovering from surgery on her hand and is having a lot of pain. <clears throat> we have over 12 members shut in or confined at home and a long list of prayers requests in the bulletin. Uh, this Saturday, August 7th, we will have our youth lectures. The topic is My Outreach to Lost People. Please make plans to attend and, and invite. We are collecting school supplies for students at East Ridge Elementary School. If you'd like to help, please take a list of needed items from the podium in the back and return the items by August 5th. Please place items in the fellowship hall and if you prefer not to shop, you can give a donation to Paula Garrett and she will do the shopping. Thank you for supporting this community outreach. <clears throat> I have a card here to read from Carol Gass and she is here with us today. Good to see her. <clears throat> Dear wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for all the cards, calls, texts, and sweet remembrances from you since I was diagnosed with stage four cancer back in December. Most of all, thank you for all the prayers you sent on my behalf. I am convinced the good Lord and answered prayers are the reason I, I am now cancer free and celebrating my 80th birthday on this very day. Our God is an awesome God, Carol Gass. And first prayer today will be Roger Campbell, closing prayer will be Eddie Howe, Scripture reading will be Les Clark. Our first song will be Happy Birthday to You. Just kidding. <laughs> Must have you back, Carol. 267, I kind of, I guess I was in an old-timey song mood this morning, so we're going to sing some, uh, some classics. 267. Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old.
we'll sing number 184. 184. Father, we count it as a privilege to come before thy throne of grace, to express our praise, our thanksgiving, to make known our petitions. Father, we're mindful of 
the Bible statement that we're to cast our cares upon thee for that does care for us so much. Father, we praise thee as the creator of the universe. And we look to thee as our rock and our fortress and our shelter in times of storm. Father, we are thankful for the really good days we enjoy. And Father, we're thankful that we've been able to have our life sustained even through dark times. And we recognize, dear God, that the testing of our faith has the potential to work patience and endurance within us. Father, there's a lot of anxiety in the world, a lot of uneasiness. We pray that as we approach our life from day to day that we would do so with thoughtfulness, relying upon Thee for wisdom, but that we not face life out of fear. For we know that perfect love casts out fear. Father, as we face challenges and temptations in life, help us to have the courage of faithful servants like Daniel the prophet, John the baptizer. Help us to have the zeal of the apostle Paul the compassion of Dorcas and others. Father, we're mindful of our flaws more than anybody. We recognize our need to make adjustments. We're thankful for thy long suffering and ask thee to strengthen us for the days that lie ahead. Father, this morning we lift up our brothers and sisters of the congregation who at some time in their past lost a spouse through death. Whether it was a few weeks ago or decades ago, we understand that their hurt is real and we ask you to bless them in a special way. Help us to be there as their encouragers. Father, we pray for our shepherds. They may feel like they have a thankless job and the only time some of us talk to them is to gripe. We pray, dear God, they'll not grow discouraged in well-doing and in faithfully acting as stewards over this flock. Father, for our special servants, our deacons, Brother Tony and Brother Reg, Brother Danny and Brother Les and Brother Josh, we're thankful for the work they do often behind the scenes and pray, dear God, they'll not grow weary in well-doing. Father, we pray for our Bible class teachers who sometimes come and they don't have students. Sometimes come and they have one student or their students are sporadic and it's easy to get frustrated. Father, we're thankful for their efforts and we ask you to bless them as they persevere and do the best job they can. Father, we pray for upcoming lectureship this coming Saturday, that it'll be a time of great encouragement a time where we can renew relationships and help each other prepare to go to heaven as we talk about reaching out to lost people. Fathers, we continue through this hour of worship. Help us to lay aside thoughts of the outside world and focus upon thee, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing number 265 and then meet her on the Lord's table. 265. Two hundred sixty-five.
reading this morning will come from Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 at verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And they set up over his head, accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved himself. Himself he cannot save. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast in the same his teeth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for your son. And we thank you for his sacrifice for us. We now take this bread in remembrance of his body that was placed upon that cross in our place. In Jesus, we ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, at this time, we offer our thanks for that blood that was shed. We offer our thanks for this fruit of the vine, which is the name of that blood. We pray as we partake that we do it in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As we consider our giving this morning, we'll read from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 28, and verse 14, Proverbs 28, 14. Happy is the man that is reverent always, but he that hardens heart shall fall into calamity. Let's pray. Lord, we now come, we so richly blessed by you. All that we have is yours, and you've blessed us with each and everything. We bring back a portion of what you've blessed us with, Lord, to be used as in your work. We ask that you would uh, make it grow for that use. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to mark number 31, that will be our invitation song, number 30, 31. And then before our lesson, we're going to sing 182, 182. If you have a Bible, would you join me this morning in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22. Before we read that text, maybe a couple of questions we ought to sort out. Is it really true that this coming Saturday we'll be hosting a lectureship? It's true. Is it true that this is the first time we've ever done that? No, that's not true. First time Greens Lake Road did that was in the year 2002. 
and have done it every year since, except for that asterisk year, which was 2020. Is it true that the lessons this week at our lectureship will be about evangelism? That's true. And is it true that those lessons will benefit our young people? That's true. Is it true that it'll benefit only our young people? No, that's not true. Uh, lessons on evangelism are helpful for, for all of us. Uh, is it true that the singing is uplifting? It really is. So we hope, regardless of your age, that you'll make an effort to be here to be part of that, to, to learn and to encourage and maybe even to meet some new folks. Matthew 22 is a part of the last week of Jesus' life. And the tensions between him and the Jewish leaders had maxed out. They'd reached a peak. He'd been teaching in the temple. He'd been doing miracles. He had cleansed the temple. And he was telling stories. He was telling parables. And, and those parables, some of them were very pointed. Some of them were specifically spoken so that the Jewish leaders would be able to see some truths. And the one we're going to look at today in chapter 22 is certainly one of those types of parables. I want to read with you beginning in verse 1, and our reading will go down through verse number 10. And then we're going to focus on one statement. Verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Verse 4. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. And they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Verse 9, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Here's a story that involves multiple characters. And as we study the parables of Jesus, it's usually helpful to try to hone in on and, and, and focus on the one main point of the story. Well, here's a, here's a story that involves a king, but it also involves the son of this king. And, and, and the king who is the father, he has this marriage, that is this marriage feast on behalf of his son. Well, the king would be God the father. And the son, well, if the king is God the father, then the son would be the son of God or Jesus. And servants are sent to call folks to the wedding. There's going to be a first calling and then a later calling. Well, the first calling would be the call that went to the Jews, and that was done throughout their history. There was a time when God was sending prophets to speak to the Israelites, there was a time when John the baptizer was speaking to the Israelites and then there was Jesus preaching to the Israelites and then there were the 12 preaching to the Israelites and then there were 
70 other disciples who were preaching to the Jews in the land of Palestine, and, and, and the message was, get ready, get ready, get ready. Great things are coming, they're coming. And now then you get to the point in verse number four, the message is, all things are ready, come. And they made light of it. Well, in general, the Jewish response to the Messiah was, well, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so when there were still seats, what does he say? He tells his servants to go out into the highways and the byways and bring in others. Well, that would be the idea of the gospel going out to the Gentiles. And so you see God's effort and you see man's response. But today we're going to focus in on a few words there in verse number four. All things are ready come. And again, in this instance, it's come to the wedding, that is, come to the marriage feast. Well, some did and some didn't. If I'm not mistaken, we actually have a spiritual song that's entitled, All Things Are Ready, or perhaps in some books, Come to the Feast. In fact, we're going to sing that song today. If we live that long, if we live to the end of this lesson, we're going to sing that song together. But we're not going to focus this morning on the parable itself, but we're going to focus on those words to all things are ready. So when you see that language, all things are ready, some questions come to mind. What does ready mean? Well, it's prepared. If you're talking about food, the food is, the food's ready, it's waiting. It, it was common in the ancient Middle East and Oriental culture when there was a special occasion to send out the early invitations and then when the time has come to send out an additional invitation with this message, things are ready, come right now. And in some places of the world, that, that's still practiced. Well, on God's part, before the foundation of the world, God had what the Bible calls his eternal purpose. God had a plan. And before the foundation of the world, the Messiah was slain as a lamb without blemish and without spot. God foreknew, God foreordained. And so there was this planning. And so God had things ready. Well, how many things are ready? Well, according to the statement there in verse number four, all things are ready. And later we're told in the New Testament that God's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and Godhood. Well, who said all things are ready? Well, the king did, right? Verse number four, again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, build I prepared and all things are ready. So the king's message through his servants was all things are ready. Now, here's, here's a situation we want to understand. If God's talking about time, then we need to pay attention. When God says it's not yet time for something, then it's not yet time. God made a promise to Abraham that he was going to give the land of Canaan where Abraham was living at that time He's going to give the land of Canaan to Abraham's descendants. He said, but not now. It's not going to happen until the fourth generation. And God said, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so God said, here's what's going to happen, but not yet. Well, when God says in, in our language, the time hasn't come, the time hasn't come. Now, if there's ever an instance where God said something is close then it's close. Well, John the baptizer and Jesus and the 12 and the 7, they all were preaching the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's close enough to reach out and touch it. It's almost here. So when God says something's near, it's near. And then when God says it's time, when God says the time has come, the time has come. After Moses died, the children of Israel mourned 
for him for 30 days and then God spoke to Joshua. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now arise and take my people over this Jordan into the land of promise. And so the time had come. And so when God says all things are ready, then guess what? (laughs) All things are ready. Now, for mankind, what does that indicate? When God says all things are ready, what does that indicate? Well, again, speaking about the time element, in God's scheduling, in God's planning, when did Jesus come into the world? And the answer would be at the very best time. What Bible thought comes to mind? Isn't it Galatians 4 and verse number 4? But when the fullness of the time had come, the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4 and verse 4. What does that mean, the fullness of the time? According to God's reasoning, God's wisdom, God's planning, God's schedule, when Jesus came into the world, it was the very best time. The prophets of old had been foretelling his coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. And then we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what do we learn? The Messiah has come. For what purpose? Well, the Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 14, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And so on, 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 on that part of the plan, in that part of the scheme, things were ready. Now, had Jesus given his life at the time he told this story that we read in Matthew 22? No, Jesus hadn't given his life. <coughs> but it was so certain that it was going to happen, he speaks of it as if it already has. It's like in in Isaiah 53, the prophecy of the coming Messiah, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. Well, that hadn't happened when Isaiah was talking about it. But it was so certain to happen that Isaiah wrote about it as if it already had. And so when you think about what does that indicate for mankind that all things are ready, the Messiah has come, he's laid down his life, he's made himself a sin offering that we through him might have forgiveness. And you and I also learn after the death of the Messiah, the Bible tells us that Jesus purchased something with his blood. What was it that he purchased? He purchased the church of God with his blood, Acts 20 and verse number 28. And he now serves as the head of his church and savior of the body, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. So to say that all things are ready, what does that indicate for mankind? Number one, the time, when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son. Number two, when the son came, he came as the savior. Number three, he used his blood to purchase the church. And number four, the Son through the Spirit has given us God's entire truth that he's going to reveal to mankind. True or false? God has told humanity everything that he knows. No, no. You say, well, why not? Well, that's his choice. He gave us revelation that let us know the amount of things he wanted us to know. You say, well, I'd like to know everything God knows. Seriously? God could give you a diary of Adam's life for 930 years. You want to read what Adam did every day of his life from from the time he got up till he went to bed? That's just one person. So, So God in his infinite wisdom has given us limited revelation. But what I'm saying is, when it comes to the truth that God is revealing to mankind, the spiritual truth, that's already, that task has been completed. Jesus, before he went back to heaven, said to his apostles, how be it the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to guide you into something. What is it? He's going to guide you into all truth, John 16, 13. And so when the Holy Spirit in the first century had guided the apostles into all truth, how much more truth was there that God was going to reveal? And the answer is none. 
once God had revealed 100% of the truth he was going to reveal, there was no more to be revealed. And so you and I living in the 21st century, we can say, look, in God's scheme of things, in God's plan to take us to heaven, all things are ready. Jesus came into the world, lived as a man, gave his life that we might be saved, purchased the church with his blood, and has given us the fullness of God's truth. What a great feast it is. You know, the folks who were invited to the king, this is a king now, a king invites people to be his guest in honor of his son's marriage. Wow, what a privilege. You reckon there might be some selfies being taken? I was at the feast with the king's son. What a privilege to be invited. What a feast it is. When you think about feast, you think about what? An abundance, right? Just wow, food overflowing. Think Thanksgiving every meal, right? Well, what about in the spiritual realm? Ephesians chapter one and verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All things are ready, come. All spiritual blessings are prepared in God's Son. And the beauty of it is under the new covenant, God said that our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. What a feast. What a family. When when we partake of that feast, I'm not talking about the Lord's Supper, But when we partake of that feast that the Lord offers the spiritual blessings through his son, we do that as as family. There's something special about loved ones getting together. So here's this feast concept, and here's this family concept. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 that Paul wrote these words to Timothy found in our Bibles in verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. To say that the church is the house of God is not talking about some structure. It's the family of God, okay? The church is God's family. And, and, and another picture of the church in 1 Corinthians 12 of it being a body and there are different members What do the members in the body, what do the members in the spiritual body do? They care for one another. When one is honored, they all rejoice together. When one suffers, they suffer together. So accepting that invitation and coming and being a part of this, what a great feast. What a great family. What a great fellowship. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, the Bible says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Fellowship means joint participation. It means sharing in something together. And as we walk together in the light, then we have that fellowship one with another. And we wouldn't trade it for anything. It's a great feast. It's a great family. It's a great fellowship, and that provides us with a great future. Remember when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, that entire chapter is about the resurrection. First, the resurrection of Jesus, and then the resurrection that will come at the end for the rest of us. And and Paul made this observation. He said, if if we in this world, if, if our only hope is in this world, then then we would be of all people most what? Most miserable or pitiful. The point he's making is because of Jesus' resurrection, our hope goes beyond this life. Our hope goes beyond the grave. We're going to be raised and so Christians have a great future. When Jesus comes again, His followers will be in two categories. 
One category, there'll be his faithful followers who have already passed from this world. And there'll be another category of his followers who still will be alive when he comes again. And those who are dead will first be raised to be with him. And then those who are alive and remain as to his coming will be caught up and so shall we ever be or always be with the Lord. Yes, those who receive this invitation, they have, they're part of a great feast, a great family, great fellowship, and a great future. Well, here's the charge now. Come. All things are ready. Come. Well, who said to come? The king did. And so here's an invitation from, from the Godhead. When you look at the entirety of the scriptures, especially in the New Covenant, what do you see? God calls us, how is it? We're into, he called you by what? Our gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father who sent me draw him. John 6 and verse 44. So the Father planned and the Father calls, and the Father draws. What about Jesus? He says, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest, Matthew 11 and verse number 28. Well, what about the Spirit? The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. That's the message that he's Revealed And so collectively, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, they draw people to Jesus. They pull people to Jesus. They plead with people. They urge people, come to Jesus. He will save you. How do they do that pleading? How do they do that urging? How do they do that calling? Through the means of the gospel message. Now, on our part, something's expected. If we're going to be the beneficiaries of that calling, then we have to receive that. It was one thing for people to be invited to the marriage feast. It was another thing for them to respond by going to the marriage feast. They had the opportunity to receive that invitation. They also had the opportunity to reject that invitation. Same is true of all of us. When the gospel is presented to a human being, that human being can either reject it or receive it. On the day of Pentecost, that's recorded in Acts chapter two, the gospel call was given to the Jews who were assembled. The call was to come unto Jesus. And some, when they heard the word, they were pricked or cut in their hearts and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was given, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word, the call was given, Call received. They that gladly received his word were what? Were baptized. And the same day they were added, and then about 3,000 souls. We read that in the Bible in Acts 2, verses 36 through 41. So humans, in order to get the benefit of the feast, they've got to hear it and receive it. Now, this could be a lesson all by itself some false notions about coming to Jesus. But we'll just mention a couple, meaning seven or eight, no, two or three. We'll mention a couple of the common misconceptions. One misconception, and sometimes it seems like it's wiggled its way into some of our songs. Sometimes the misconception is We don't go to Jesus, he comes to us. Well, I was going down the road and Jesus came to me. What? What do you mean he came to me? Well, I was going down the road and the Holy Spirit came to me. What? What do you mean he came to you? There's a sense in which God 
comes to us through the gospel, but it's not in some miraculous way that nobody can explain. No, no, the Bible's message is we come to Jesus. Jesus said, you come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily, and no man can come to me. And so the direction is we go to Jesus and we'll preach you. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere, can't tell you where, but I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Now, what about that one? Well, there is a Bible statement in Revelation 3 and verse 20, and it is a quotation of Jesus saying, I stand at the door and knock, and he who opens, I'll come in and, and we'll have a meal together, but Notice carefully, that wasn't spoken to people who were outside of the Lord Jesus. That was spoken to members of his church. In fact, it was spoken to the church in Laodicea who needed to get their act together. So no, it's not the Lord coming to us in some mysterious way that nobody can explain or understand. It's us coming to him in response to the gospel. And, and you know, sometimes the thought is expressed, one of the most common things is we come to the Lord by praying to him. No, that's not the way that lost people come to the Lord for the first time. The way lost people come to the Lord for the first time is they hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, and they obey it by being baptized for the remission of sins. Now, that's Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. Well, what, what are some things that, that a person would need to have in order to come to the Lord in the proper way. Well, what about humility? A recognition that I am lost. A recognition that I need what God has and I can't do it by myself. There needs to be an understanding that this is just not a, a, a few second process and then I'm done and gee, the Lord and I will part our ways. I'll, I'll go my way and he'll go his way. No, no, no. This is a life long commitment. You say, we're going to scare people to death. Well, I, I never have. I never have caused a person to be so scared that they died. But that, we're certainly not wanting to make people tremble. But we want them to understand this, this business of following Jesus, this is life and death right here, baby. This is hell and heaven right here, baby. This is important stuff. And it's not for a portion of our life. It's for the rest of our life. One of the expressions we see throughout the book of Hebrews is we're to hold fast unto the end. It takes courage. It takes courage to confess Jesus when we know folks around us don't appreciate Jesus. It takes courage to lay aside man-made traditions and our past and say, look, this is way different from the way I was raised, but this is right, and I'm gonna do what the Bible says. It takes courage. It takes faith. It takes faith to accept what the Bible says and come to Jesus on God's terms because in reality, those are the only terms that matter. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him, Hebrews chapter five and verse nine. And when you think about it, come, come, all things are ready. That is, at the same time, both an invitation, please come, and an obligation. As a human being, what's my greatest task in life? Well, throughout all ages, the principle is the same. Fear God and what? Keep his commandments. For this is a whole, or whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, and verse number 13. Paul preached in the city of Athens, God commands all men everywhere to repent. God commands it. It's an obligation. It's an obligation to come. But it's an invitation, and God forces no one to do it. As we prepare to sing this song this morning, there may be someone in our number who's here never obeyed the gospel. They've never come to Jesus for the remission of sins. The blood of Calvary has the power to wash away every sins today just like it did nearly 2,000 years ago. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God and you're ready to turn from your sins in repentance, confess your faith and be baptized for the remission of sins, God will add you to his church. And then he wants us to live faithful. If you're a child of God and need the prayers of the saints, all things are ready. 
for you to come. God's invitation. Would you come? Would you sing this? All things are ready. Come to the today. It was good for us to be here amongst our brethren, some that we haven't seen for a while, some that need extra prayers. Father, we're so thankful that we have you to turn to in time of need, in time of joy. We pray, Father, that we will always be subject to thy will. Father, we also pray that you would continue to bless this congregation Please be with our elders as they study to make sure this congregation goes the way it should according to thy word. And Father, be with each individual of us as we study also from thy word. We pray, Father, for our country that you have provided for us. We pray also, Father, for the elected leaders that they would turn to thy word and learn what to do. In all things, Jesus, we ask in thy name. Amen.
I'm so thankful that you are part of our class today. I'm so thankful that you're interested in studying God's Word and learning as much as, as we can and just appreciate so much you being here. We're going to be studying from the book of Second Peter as we continue our studies in that book. Before we begin, though, we want to go to God in prayer. You bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for every blessing of life. Thou hast been so good to us in giving us Thy Holy Word. We pray, dear Father, that Thou would be with us as we study it today. Help us, Father, to rightly divide Thy Word of Truth. We pray, dear Father, that we'll have understanding of these things that we study. We pray that we can commit these things to our memory and be able to call upon them from time to time. And help us, Father, to examine our lives and where we need to make corrections. We pray that we would do that. Father, we're so thankful that our sister Carol was able to be with us today. and We pray, dear Father, we know she has more to go, and we pray that you'll continue to give her the blessings of health that she needs. And Father, we pray that you'd be with us now as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Part of our text, our part in Second Peter begins at verse 16, but we're going to be studying about an event that Peter uh, reminds his uh, readers of. And you remember last week in our lesson, verse 15 of Second Peter chapter 1, verse 15 said, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. In this last epistle that he's writing to Christians, recognizing that his time, his time here on earth, his earthly life is getting ready to end. He's about to be put to death because, he, because of his faith in, in Jesus. And so he's wanting to leave some information bring to their remembrance some things that they already know. And he made that clear last week. You know, he told them that there were things that they needed to add to their Christian character so that they could make their calling and election sure. And he said, you know these things. You've been taught them before, but I'm giving it to you again. Repetition is the way we remember things. And so he has something that he wants to bring to their remembrance beginning at verse 16 and it has to do with the transfiguration of, of Jesus. And so the way we're going to start our lesson is going to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, which is the account of the transfiguration. And the title of our lesson is Eyewitnesses of His Majesty. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Why was this experience made available to Peter, James, and John. Why did they need this experience? And the reason is so that they could give eyewitness testimony of this transfiguration so that when people heard their eyewitness testimony, then they would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's why this experience was given to Peter and James and John. 
why just Peter, James, and John and not the other 12? Well, Peter, James, and John were with the Lord on a lot of, well, on a lot, two other occasions that we have record of where Peter, James, and John were with the Lord. One was the raising of Jairus' daughter. This event, the transfiguration, and then when they were in the garden, when Jesus was praying in the garden before he was uh, taken prisoner, it was Peter, James, and John that went further into the garden with Jesus. And so the thought is that these three were better prepared. Their spiritual maturity was at a place where they could receive what they were going to see. That their life was such that what they saw when Jesus told them, now don't you, don't you reveal what you have seen to anyone until after I have risen from the dead. And he knew that these three would be able to do that, which they did. And so Jesus had reason why these are the three that he chose to go with him up on this mountain says it's a high mountain. It doesn't name that mountain, but the location where they were at this time was Caesarea Philippi. That's where they were. And the, the high mountain that's near Caesarea Philippi is Mount Hermon. That's the mountain 9,200 feet in elevation. And it's a mountain, it's, it's not like a straight up mountain like Sinai, just rock granite. It's, it has grassy slopes, but there are terraces along those grassy slopes going up to that 9,200 9, feet elevation. That's where we believe this transfiguration took place, on Mount Hermon. Verse 2 says, and he was transfigured before them. Transfigured before them, meaning that he was transformed. He was changed. His human body was changed to a glorified state. And in that glorified state, it says that his face shone like the sun. Now we know how bright the sun is. And this part of, of that he was in in Syria, the sun is extremely bright. It says that his face shone brighter just like the sun. And that his clothes became as white as light. Meaning Luke, I think, says his clothing was so white it was whiter than any laundry could produce the whiteness thereof. And verse 3 says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses. Moses was the lawgiver. He was the mediator between the Jews and, and God. He's recognized as giving them the law, and it was called the law of Moses. And then we have Elijah. Elijah was the prophet. He was, he's called the dean of the prophets. And Moses and Elijah, they're also appearing in their glorified state. And they're talking with Jesus. And in Luke's account of this event, in Luke chapter 9, Luke says that they were talking about Jesus' decease, about his death that was going to take place shortly uh, in Jerusalem. And so that was what the subject of this discussion was. Peter, 
James and John were able to see they were able to see the glorified state of Jesus. They were able to see the glorified state of Moses and of Elijah. How did he know that this was Moses and Elijah? It could be that he, when he heard them talking, they heard Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and during that conversation it was revealed that this was Moses and Elijah. They had been dead for hundreds of years when this event took place but yet they were they were raised up to be here with, with Jesus at this time. Verse 4 says that when Peter, when the Peter, James, and John, when they saw this, it's Peter who answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Verse 4. Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In Luke's account, it says, Peter didn't know what he was saying. You ever heard someone be at a loss of words? You know, this event was so magnificent that Peter was at a loss of words. So he just, Peter was the kind of fellow that he's going to say something. Uh, and so he just says, well, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And a tabernacle just means a tent, a dwelling place, some place where they could have comfort, some place where they could talk with them. Peter makes no distinction between We'll build a tabernacle for Jesus. We'll build a tabernacle for Moses. We'll build one for Elijah. He puts them all three on equal footing there. But then verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. It says a bright, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Well, we were told earlier that Jesus, his face shone brighter than the sun. His garments were whiter than, than the whitest that, that anyone could make a garment. But yet, the brightness of this cloud overshadows the brightness of the presence of these glorified beings. And this cloud, throughout the Bible, we read about a cloud being a manifestation of the presence of God, that God is here. Do you remember when... Solomon dedicated the temple after he had built the, the temple and after they had dedicated all the, the items of worship that a cloud filled the temple. And that cloud was so thick that it was so dark that nobody could even see. That's how thick this cloud was. And so this cloud indicates this is the presence of God. There, you know, uh, did Josephus, the historian, talk about how dark it was that day in the uh, dedication of, of the temple? I'm not sure. I haven't read that in Josephus, but he might have because he wrote a lot of history 
about that period of time. So it's it's very possible. Yeah, yeah. But that cloud overshadowed the brightness here. And then there is a voice that comes out of the cloud. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Three things there that this voice out of the cloud tells us. This is my beloved son. God honors the son by owning him. This is my beloved son. He says, in who I am well pleased. He's my son and I am well pleased. Why is God so pleased with Jesus? You just think about it. One, he has left heaven and taken on a fleshly existence here on earth. He is to give his life upon the cross. He's going to be obedient. He's going to learn things through the suffering that he does in obedience to God. God's pleased with his coming in the flesh. He's pleased with his obedience, even obedience even to the death of the cross. And then he's pleased hear him Jesus his son in whom he's well pleased is to be heard he has authority and in the presence of Moses who's a representative of the law and Elijah, who's representative of the prophets, he says, you are to hear my son now. He now has the authority and you are to listen to what he says. Moses no longer has authority. The prophets no longer have authority over you. You are to hear my son. Yes, Reggie. I think this is a good lesson that Peter learned later on in the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius did the same thing Peter did with Moses and Titus. Cornelius was going to worship Peter, and Peter said, No, I'm just a man. That, that's, that's a good observation, yeah. Yeah, at the house of Cornelius, Peter refused to receive worship from a man. God is to be worshipped, yeah. And now, the ending of the Jewish covenant is made known right here at this transfiguration. The ending of the Jewish covenant because... Moses is no longer to exercise the authority that he did formerly. The authority of the prophets is no longer to be exercised. It is now my son that you are to hear and listen to. Verse 6 says, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. You know, every time the voice of God is mentioned as being heard in the ears of of man, there's always this reaction to fall on your fall on your face, to not to not see the source of that voice, and that voice is so powerful. 
You remember at Sinai when God spoke to the people with his voice and the people were so terrified of God's voice and they told Moses, and said, said, Moses says, uh, you listen to what God says and you tell us what God says, but we don't want to hear the voice of God lest we die. And when the Lord appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, when he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul fell on his face before the Lord. John, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, when John heard the Lord's voice, he said he fell down face first on the ground. So no wonder the disciples, when they heard this voice, they fell on their faces. It says they were greatly afraid. And then verse 7, Jesus, Jesus takes away their fear. But Jesus came and touched them. He touched them so they'd know he's still with them and he is still there watching over them. And so don't be afraid. Arise and don't be afraid. He knew the fear that was in the Peter, James, and John. And he says, you all don't be afraid. I'm here with you and touch them. I'm still in the flesh. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The fact that Moses and Elijah had gone away and the only one remaining was Jesus shows that both of them have been removed in terms of authority and the end of the law is coming it's going to come when Jesus is nailed to the cross and they are to hear Jesus. He has authority from God. And so this is Matthew's account of this transfiguration, this transforming that took place here on the mountain. And then we turn to Second Peter. And let's look at the application that Peter makes of what transpired there. Because we're going to see that Peter regarded the transfiguration, he regarded as a foreshadowing of the second coming of Christ. He regarded what he saw there on the mountain as a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus when he comes again in all his glory and majesty. That's what he beheld when he saw Jesus in his glorified state. And he says that's a foreshadowing of the events that are going to take place when Jesus comes again in all his glory and majesties with the whole host of heaven. That's what this transfiguration foreshadows. And he wants, he wants his Christians that are reading this epistle that he's writing, he wants them to remember this event, this transfiguration. It was so significant in the mind of Peter because it, we said at the beginning that, that this experience was given to Peter and James and John so that they could provide eyewitness testimony that would cause men and women to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he's going to recount that here. John, now James, 
James is dead. Jane has, James has been killed by the sword by Herod. But Peter and John are still alive. And John in his writings in John chapter 1 and verse 14, I want to read that. John chapter 1 and verse 14, John writes, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. When did He behold that glory? On the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus in His glorified state. And over in 1 John, in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That transfiguration made an impression on the Apostle John. In both of his writings, he brings that in his writings to remind people of the glory of the Son and that he is the Son of God. And then that's exactly what Peter is doing here in verse 16 that we're going to read now. 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. There on the Mount of Transfiguration, we were eyewitnesses. He, Peter, James, and I, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We didn't follow. When, when, we, when we preached to you, when we preached to you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, when we preached to you about his power, about the miracles that Jesus was able to do when he was on the earth, and then the miracle of his resurrection. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he said, Declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. That resurrection showed the power of Jesus. And when Peter preached to them, he preached to them about the power, the power of the resurrection. He preached to them about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, talking about when he comes again, that second coming. This transfiguration foreshadowed that second coming. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, his greatness, of his lofty dignity. He is king. We witnessed his majesty there on the mountain of transfiguration. So he wants to write something that they can remember. He's writing this, and we didn't follow... What we preached to you was not a cunningly devised fable. A fable is a fictitious story. It's a story of fiction made up in men's minds. He said, when we preached to you, we weren't preaching a fictitious story that came from, that was a product of man's imagination. You know, all the 
all the Greek, the Roman gods, they always had these myths and fables about them that people would repeat. He said, that's not what, when we preached to you, we weren't preaching to you some made-up story. We are eyewitnesses of this event that took place, this transfiguration. This is not a made-up fable. We beheld his majesty and his glory. And then he recounts in verse 17, for them, the transfiguration scene. He says in verse 17, for we, we received from God the Father, for he received from God the Father honor, honor and glory, honor when God owned him as his son, glory when he was transformed into a glorified saint. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And verse 18 says, and we heard this voice. We not only saw Jesus in his glorified state, but we heard a voice. So we're not only an eyewitness, we're an ear witness to what took place on this mountain. We are eye and ear witness. The voice which came down from heaven when we were with him on the holy mount. No wonder Peter and John this was such a significant event in their lives. And they couldn't tell anybody about this until after Jesus has risen from the dead. But they're writing now after Jesus has, was risen from the dead and they're giving their eyewitness account to these Christians and they want these Christians to remember that they were eyewitnesses to this event that took place. And because of that, they need, to, they need to have faith and confidence in the teaching that Peter brought to them. And here's something else that that transfiguration did. In verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. That transfiguration, that transfiguration helped to provide confirmation of the writings of the prophets. The Old Testament prophets Moses. David in the Psalms, Isaiah. They prophesied about the coming Messiah. They prophesied about his coming, his being God with us. They prophesied about his suffering. They prophesied about where he would be born. They prophesied that he was going to be the son of David. They prophesied that he would not be left in the grave. Every prophecy that was written about Jesus by the Old Testament prophecies was fulfilled. This transfiguration, this eyewitness account of Jesus saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased confirms everything that the prophets had written about Jesus. They had written about his deity. They had written about his death. They had written about his resurrection. And the transfiguration provides confirmation to everything those prophets had written. 
So we have the prophetic word confirmed by this transfiguration that I'm telling you about. You would do well to heed the writings of the prophets. Now we said, Jesus said, you know, this is my beloved son, hear him. That means Moses no longer has authority. The prophets no longer have authority in directing our lives. But there is value in that prophetic word and you need to read it and study it and you need to give attention to it because it writes about the Son of God. Give heed as a light that shines in a dark place. The world is a dark place without the light of the gospel. The world is a place like a dark dungeon, like a, a place of ignorance, a place of unforgiveness, a place of condemnation. But the Messiah, Jesus, when he came, he brought light, the light of the gospel. There is forgiveness of sin now. You can be a child of God through obedience to the gospel. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he says here, just like when the sun rises in the morning, the sun is the day star. When that sun first appears, that tells us that a day, a daylight is coming. When Jesus came, that says that light is coming. Jesus is like that day star, the light of the world. And when we obey the gospel, when men, men and women hear that gospel and obey it, obey it from the heart, take in the teaching of God's word, then they now have light. And the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied about this light that was coming. And you do well to heed and read and study what they said and then see how Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophets. And you know when the gospel was first preached, if you look at Paul when he would go into places like Antioch of Pisidia, he would go to Old Testament prophecies and prove that Jesus was the Son of God. If you look at what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he went to the prophecies of David to show that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And so those Old Testament prophecies are confirmed. Jesus fulfilled every one of them. And then he goes on to talk about these prophets, about the how prophecy came about. Verse 20, he said, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. didn't originate in someone's personal in someone's mind those that delivered the prophecy they delivered a message from God that's what a prophet does a prophet delivers a message from God and so Prophecy didn't originate with those that delivered the message. It wasn't something that they developed on their own, Bob.
Yeah. In, in the new in the age of miracles, when when spiritual gifts were available, there were a lot of false prophets out there, and men were endowed with the spiritual gift of interpreting the prophecy. They didn't have that in the Old Testament time. Well, no, no. There were men that that could test. It says test every spirit to see whether it's from God, and those were men that were endowed with the ability to determine if that prophecy was was from God or not. They had knowledge, miraculous knowledge. Yeah, but you are right in in tongues. Those that are speaking in tongues. You're not supposed to use that gift unless somebody's there to interpret. What you were saying. It, it would be a message. Okay. Yeah. And he says here that no prophecy of Scripture, that means Old Testament Scripture and New Testament Scripture, that prophecy. But there, there were false prophets around during Old Testament times. I remember in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah there was an old prophet named Hananiah. And Hananiah prophesied that in two years the children of Israel would be coming from Babylonian captivity. It says two more years and then the, the yoke of Babylon will be broken. And Jeremiah was prophesying it's 70 years. Hananiah is a lying prophet. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses gave a, a, a way that you could tell if a prophet was a prophet from God. He said, if what that man prophesies comes to pass, then he is a true prophet of God. But if he's if it doesn't come to pass, then that means he was not a true prophet of God. Yes, he yes he did. Prophesied that the name would be Cyrus. Yeah, the Persian king. It says, For the prophecy came for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how the prophecy, that's how, that's the process of inspiration. The prophecies were inspired by God. Less? Prophecy never came by the will of man, meaning it was, it was not a fabrication, something that man developed in his own will, in his own knowledge, and then told the people that this was from God. So it, it, was, it didn't come from the will of man. Bob, did you... Yeah. Their agenda. Yeah. Well, and you know, you could, you could, you could speak a prophecy that is what you would like to see happen. And that's by your will, but that's not what God. That's what Hananiah said. Said these people are going to be returned from captivity in two years. Maybe that's what he would like to have happened, but that's not what God said. And so the prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke. 
in First Timothy or Second Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen, we have that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the word inspiration there means God breathed. So the message is God breathed. And so prophecy, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved by the Holy Spirit has the idea of like a ship that's sailing on the water and it's borne along. God was using these men as instruments to convey his will. God directed what they wrote and he and he directed it by the Holy Spirit. Verse, uh, verse 20 is used by the Catholic Church. It says no scripture is of any private interpretation. And they, says that, they say that that means that man cannot read the scripture and accurately interpret it. And so they say that's why the Pope who is infallible, he's the one that has to interpret Scripture. But if you look at this verse, you see that it, he's not talking about the person that's receiving the message. He's talking about the person that's delivering the message. It's not a result of their private interpretation. He's not talking about the one that's hearing. And so that's not a verse that one can use to say that man's not able to understand the scriptures. Any other comment or question? <laughs> yeah, that means you can't understand it. Yeah, it, it defeats it. I don't know whether we'll have time to get to many of our questions here. Let's, let's see what we can do. What three apostles joined Jesus at the Transfiguration? Yeah. How did, how did God exalt Jesus over Moses and Elijah? This is my beloved son. Hear him. Question number three. How did Peter differentiate his message from cunning and devised fables? We're eyewitnesses. This is not something fabricated in men's mind. We are eyewit we are ear witnesses. We heard and we saw it. What did Peter say the transfiguration did for prophecy? Confirmed. Yeah, confirmed. What is not a genuine source of prophecy? Man, man is not a genuine source of prophecy. Well, if, if man's not a source, what is the genuine source of prophecy? The Holy Spirit, God. The Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit. Well, thank you for your attention. We're going to study chapter 2 next week. Thank you very much.